uh, yeah, thanks for coming, guys. I know this is a uh, last presentation. Uh, you know what they say, save, uh, save the best for last. Uh, so this is my talk. Don't reinvent the GEF wheel. Um, I, I know it was very technical, technical speech before me, so this will be the complete opposite. It's very uh, untechnical. So I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. So uh, yes, I am a library dot Ethereum virtual machine. I'm uh, a couple things. I'm a mempool inspector. I'm a sandwich connoisseur. And I'm kind of here mainly because I kind of wanted a free ticket to MEV day, which is why uh, I'm, a talk I'm on the stage right now. Uh, yeah. Um, so I don't really claim to know everything. Uh, I, I, I know some of the giants. I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of the giants. Like the Geff creators are here. I know the Forge creators are here. I use those tools. I'm a humble searcher. I don't claim to know anything, so if you see anything wrong, you can, you can honk at me if you want. Or if you guys are in Amsterdam these days, you do like, like the bicycles. I got ranked by a lot of the bicycles. You can also do that if you guys are up for that. But yeah, I guess uh, before we start, I would like to talk about something pretty serious. Uh, we, let's, let's talk some numbers here. Like, like I guess, uh, how many euros worth of MEV has been extracted. Does anyone have an idea? Like since, since the inception of Flashbots. Does anyone have any idea? 800 million. 800 million euros? Yeah. Uh, anyone else? No? Okay, well, it's uh, a little bit off. It's actually 550 million euros total extracted MEV. Um, and you can get that from uh, explore.flashbots.net. Um, and I know there's a couple of Americans out there uh, that, that might look like a funny symbol, the euro symbol, so I'll kind of convert it to empirical units for you, which is roughly about 0.6 of an Andre. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's a current mark, uh, current, today's exchange rate might differ. Um, I'm also very confident that approximately 100% of the MEV extracted are being extracted by people who are not in this room right now. I mean, why else, would you, why, else, why else would you guys listen to my talk if you guys could extract it, right? I think uh, that's because uh, this is like the uh, average perception. Uh, this is uh, the perception of the average MEV searcher. I know this is like a, a huge brain dump. So I'm going to let you guys read that for a couple seconds while I take a sip of water. And unironically, it kind of, kind of fits into the previous slides, uh, the previous presentation, which was incredible, by the way. It's just I did not understand any of the Greek symbols. <laughs> Can everyone read, read the text on it? We good? Okay. Just making sure. But uh, so that was the, the previous slide basically gave you a glimpse into the, the, what people think is the average MEV searcher. But this is in reality, um, a lot of MEV searchers like to make things that just works enough. And this is my favorite example. It's a, it's a, it's a manual calculator. It checks, like, it checks, your, checks both of your numbers and checks the operator. And it, it, it pre-computes the result and it prints it for you. I would also like to highlight uh, the number of lines. There's 20,000 lines right there for a calculator, like a very simple calculator. Um, this is actually not really far from reality. As uh, my favorite uh, Twitter friend here, Togat PVP, actually has, a, has a, his first MEV bot, uh, which is about actually originally about 16K lines, was printing money uh, yeah, in one file, I might add. So this is actually, it's like, there's a very stark contrast between reality and perception. So I just want to just wanna point it out there. So a lot of you might be asking, uh, why are you here today? Or why, why are you showing me all these slides? Well, I've been getting a lot of DMs on, on the Bluebird app asking me to, to share my MEV, MEV knowledge. Um, and if I share it correctly, if I share it and they're able to profit, they'll share half the profits to me, which is incredibly generous. Um, so today, I'm going to teach everyone how to get a real job, which is uh, doing MEV. Not, yeah. So yeah, if you can't describe your jobs in, in three words, it's, it's, I'm sorry to say, but you have a bullshit job, my friend. 
Either I do MEV. That's, a, that's the correct and real job. Yes. In the words of Gavin Wood, give me GEF or give me DEF. Uh, GEF is the, uh, the, the standard choice for uh, MEV extraction. Um, GEF loves MEV. Even the official flashboards client, MEV GEF, is far from the Go Ethereum. And uh, if you look at the, uh, GoE, uh, the MEV GEF, GEF client, you would see that I made a PR. I pushed the request, so I'm actually a contributor to MEV GEF. In fact, I even uh, wanted to be the uh, uh, community manager for, for flashboards, but I got rejected. So if anyone out there is hiring for community managers, I'm uh, just saying I'm on the market. Uh, so yeah, these are the three features from GEF that I've uh, found really helpful. Uh, state overrides, tracer, and GraphQL, and we'll kind of go through them uh, bit by bit. Um, they've, they've helped me tremendously in my journey of uh, MEV searching. From, went from zero to hero, uh, managed to uh, managed to land a couple, uh, from zero bundles to a couple bundles. Um, yeah, it's very, very useful, and we'll get to it. So state overrides. What is it? Why do I care? Why does it matter? In fact, oh, something, something really interesting was I was... I, was, uh, I met a GEF developer the other day who, who wrote, I think he wrote the state overwrite features. Um, and he was shocked to hear that I was actually using it because he said, oh, nobody uses that. Why do you use that? So here, I'm just letting a GEF, GEF developer, Sina, I think his name was Sina. I have a slide just on state overrides, just for you. Um, so I guess the, common, uh, the, the most common problem that occurs uh, for searches is like, how do you test your new contracts? Uh, when, um, in production, uh, because uh, I think it's a lot easier on L2s because uh, you don't need to factor in gas deployment costs. Uh, but, um, uh, when you, uh, so if you've made your smart contract on your bot logic, how do you test your new uh, smart contract? Because it's really hard to replicate the uh, the production environment. Uh, like like when an op opportunity comes, like how do you actually test it? How do you actually like? Do the whole integration test between your bot logic, the smart contract, and the bun and 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 the uh, the transaction, the mempool. Like, how do you combine those, and how do you test that in real time? That's actually uh, really hard. And we're all really familiar with Vitalik's law, which is the closer you are to deploying a contract, the higher the gas fees <laughs> shoot, shoot up. So, um, state overrides help you avoid that. So, an if call, uh, which is a RPC method in GEF. It allows you to execute a new message. It ba it's basically used as a view-only method. But in some situations, like the uni v3 quota, you can kind of you can. It's like a little hack where you can call mutable functions, uh, but you call it a view-only method to kind of extract out a value. Um, so that's essentially if call. It, it does a call, a view-only call, but you can do it on on mutable functions. It's just that it's not recommended. Um, so, for example, if I did, did an if call to this uh, transfer function, which returns success, I can kind of simulate it in, in a, simulate that on mainnet uh, to see if it will return a successful transact a transfer. Um, that's assuming that you're following the ERC20 standard, because if you're USDT, uh, you don't really return anything. So uh, this wouldn't work if you're trying to simulate it for USDT. So this is how you would sort of use it, uh, use the RPC function. You do an if call, you supply uh, like some kind of contract payload, um, some kind of data that you encode it, uh, ABI encoded data from to, you know, the usual. But what people don't realize is that with if call, you can actually add, uh, there is actually a couple, um, you can actually add a third object. Uh, the second object is, uh, is a, a block number, which is by default latest. But on, on the third parameter, you can have this object called known as a state override set, where you can override certain features in a, a, a certain, uh, certain state of, uh, you can override certain state. So for example, you can override the balance of a, of a contract or an account. You can override the nonce of an account. You can override the code of an account. You can override the state. When I say state, I mean like the, the storage values, like the key mapping, the raw storage values, like when you read from uh, I think it's levels DB or something. When you read from levels DB, like what's the raw value in there? And you can, or you can specify a state difference, which uh, it's like a, it's a, it's a very subtle difference. It's, it's basically to override the individual slots, whereas the state would override all slots. So just, just keep that in mind. So this would be an example on how we would use it. Uh, we supply the original payload, and then we give the uh, the latest block. And we add in our state override method right here. 
And if you can see here, it's uh, on what we're specifying here is essentially on the address 42, we would like to deploy a new contract bytecode, uh, deployed bytecode that we would like the code to be that. And we would like the state difference at slot zero to be um, our ETH account address. And the reason why we do that is because maybe your contract has some kind of ownership checking, which uh, on a lot of contracts would be, uh, the owner object would be on slot zero. So here we're saying that on address 42, we have a new, uh, new contract, which could be the contract you're testing or the contract you haven't deployed. And for the state differences, we would like these state differences to be applied. So you can overwrite the state as you do ETH call. And this is incredibly useful because when you're testing your contracts, as are your new contracts alongside with your bot logic or your new bot logic with your contracts, you're doing this in a very mutable manner and you can kind of see what values it return. I'm assuming, uh, I'm assuming your functions return values, by the way. Uh, if it doesn't return values and it doesn't revert, it might be slightly different, but in this case it does. Um, um, yeah, so you can, over, you can basically, uh, I would say, hot deploy it um, for every, every, every call you make. So it's a, lot, uh, it's a lot cheaper to kind of test new contracts. Uh, the second thing I would like to talk about is the uh, JavaScript tr tracer, which, is, uh, which I found really handy. Very, very handy, especially when we're dealing with poisonous tokens. Uh, does anyone here remember Salmonella? Yes? Yes. yes? Okay, great. Well, uh, I didn't get wrecked, but a lot of other people got wrecked. So how Salmonella worked in a nutshell is that they tried to change the uh, production environment. So the, uh, they, would like, uh, they would like to create a, uh, override the transfer function so that it would slightly differ uh, in the production environment and the test environment. And so one way you could do that is by checking the, the mine of the block. So for example, if the mine of the block was hot hat's uh, uh, testnet Coinbase or mainnet Coinbase account, then you would transfer it. So in the search simulation, it would be successful and it would fire off the bundle. But if it were to be mined on the mainnet, this, this slight, uh, this slight uh, logic statement wouldn't, wouldn't be valid and so the transfer function would actually not be executed. So that's a kind of poisonous token in a nutshell where they try and, they try and kind of create this delta between, between a production environment and your testing environment. So try and find little nuances there. So test and prod, guys, test and prod. So I hope this isn't too small, but what you can do is you can actually use a, a RPC method call, also known as debug trace call, and apply a custom JavaScript tracer. As you can see here, I'm basically checking the opcodes of each, uh, 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 the, each of the opcodes. And I'm basically seeing, hey, if the opcode is Coinbase, difficulty, number of origin, and it looks a bit suspicious because why does an ERC20 transfer function need to read from block Coinbase, uh, from the Coinbase? Why, why does it need to use the op Coinbase opcode? Why does it need the difficulty opcode? Why does it need the block number opcode? Why does it need a TX origin opcode? It's just a little bit suspicious. And so we can kind of return, uh, we can, we can kind of do a really quick trace over and then kind of pop it out and tell us, hey, these are the suspicious opcodes. Um, and from that, we can kind of infer that this could be a poisonous token or it could not be a poisonous token. But yeah, it's a, you do a debug trace call, the parameters are all the same, you from to some kind of encoded function data, which is usually your uh, custom arbitrage function. Um, and yeah, you just apply this JavaScript tra tracer. I, I would love to show you guys a lot more uh, a, a deeper dive into the tracer, but unfortunately, it, the, the documentation is, is huge, There's, and it's, it's very confusing, and I've been trying to put less code on the slides, but unfortunately, um, I, unfortunately, uh, I didn't really, I didn't really think too much in advance. Um, so the third section I would like to talk about is GraphQL. I'm not sure if anybody in here knows that Geth actually has an inbuilt GraphQL. Does anybody know about that? Yes, a couple people. That's great. Um, yeah, since EIP 1767, which uh, has been out, I think, since 2020, Geth has uh, actually GraphQL built in. You guys can check it out right there. Um, and to actually, you actually have to uh, run Geth with a custom with, with a few additional parameters, dash dash HTTP and dash dash GraphQL to make sure the GraphQL library actually runs. Um, yeah, but 
uh, using GraphQL is actually really simple. You just, uh, this is entirely in JavaScript. I apologize, by the way. I know a lot of uh, Rust fans out here, but uh, it is what it is. And so you can kind of specify, for example, uh, in, this, uh, in this request, I'm actually trying to get out the reserve values from sushi, uh, sorry, uni v2 pairs, from sushi wef and uni wef. Um, so I'm trying to get extract out the reserves, reserve values from, from the latest block. Um, it might not seem like much, but uh, using this method, you can actually extract out a lot of the reserves uh, in one call, which is very handy. Um, uh, very handy, especially if you're calculating arbitrage uh, opportunities or backward running opportunities uh, between like 50K pairs or something, as they previously mentioned, and you want to be able to continuously update it. Um, there's actually a lot more uh, you could, there's a lot, uh, the GraphQL interface is actually a lot more powerful than this one, but I find myself coming back to extracting out the storage slots using this method. Um, so yeah, there, there is an inbuilt GraphQL, uh, GraphQL interface for you guys to play around with. Uh, a little bit of parting advice, if I have, um, is that, you know, uh, programming socks, plus 10 intelligence to anyone. Uh, who uses them? It's very comfortable. Speaking from experience, um, it's uh, it's very underrated. But uh, just you want to bring that to light. Uh, you even can buy the C programming book together. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's my slides. It's all the five minute mark. I think I rushed through it a little bit. Any questions? No? Okay, great.